In a recent New Yorker interview, American novelist, playwright, poet, and satirist Ismail Reed revealed that as of late, he's deeply unimpressed by the recent Black Lives Matter inspired wave of interest in anti-racist literature, which he dismisses as being hyper-focused on life coaching, books about how to get along with Black people. Anti-racism, he says, is the new yoga. And Ishmael Reed's thoughts on this topic really let me know that I am not completely losing it. I myself have been deeply unimpressed by a lot of the literature that's being touted as anti-racist. The wave of middle grade and YA books that are being promoted as tackling issues and having social commentary, it all feels very dry. It feels very cut straight from social media timelines. It's not offering any real analysis of racism or structures in society that uphold racism and white supremacy. A lot of times when I've been reading these books lately, I have felt that they are extremely lazy in their racial analysis. They center whiteness and or they just feel like these like how-to guides, just like Ishmael Reed said, on how to deal with Black people. Recently, I have read two really good books that discuss social justice and discuss racism and discuss social issues. And there's one that I had a big problem with. And so we're gonna get into those books. This is my wrap up of YA middle grade novels that I read during April, May, and June. So if you're interested in seeing my thoughts on these three middle grade and YA books, some fiction, some nonfiction, keep on watching and let's get right into it. All right, so um, I have been getting dragged <laughs> on a regular basis about my ring light and the light that you can see in my eyes. So we're not going to use that for this video. I'll see how I feel about the quality of the video and the lighting and everything. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Do you prefer it with no ring light? I think my lighting is okay, um, but the ring light definitely adds that extra bit of glow. You know, before we get into this, make sure you press that thumbs up button. Make sure you press that subscribe button if you haven't already. And also make sure that you follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both handles are be black, be loved. And um, those are where you can kind of see me posting like thoughts. I'm trying to get a lot more um, active on those platforms, posting things like daily and, and just let me know what content you would like to see me posting on Instagram and you know I just tweet my thoughts on Twitter. I've been trying to do some threads with quotes from books and all of that stuff. But um so yeah so this is I already posted my regular uh reading wrap up. It was three months worth of books, uh not a not a huge amount of books, but um it was just what I've been reading over the past couple of months. Now things are picking up. But I did want to do a separate video talking about the YA middle grade books because I had a lot of thoughts um, and I think that now is the time that I can really share them. So the first book that I really, really enjoyed, I think that yeah, let's go with a positive first, that I really, really enjoyed, um, that I thought tackled really complex topics really well was Punching the Air by E.B. Zaboy. Also with Yusuf Salam of the Exonerated Five, I definitely would encourage everybody to watch um, the Central Park Five series if you have not already. It's still on Netflix. It was it it was a heart wrenching series, and I think that if we're talking about the flaws and the the racism that is inherently a part of the criminal justice system, you definitely uh, need to watch that series. And picking up this book, so this is a YA novel. It is written in verse. Um, let me get the page count. I'll include it also on the uh, on the front. 
but it is 386 pages, but it reads like a hundred, to be honest. Like you will fly through this book. I felt the same way uh, when I was reading The Poet X, which is also written in verse. You sort of get so, um, you're, you're so into the story that it does not feel like the book is that many pages. So this is 386 pages, but I was able to uh, fly through it very quickly. I think that really one of the poems that I, a portion of one of the poems that I really, really loved um, from this was, I think of that trip that never happened in the door of no return. My life, my whole damn life before that courtroom, before that trial, before that night was like Africa. And this door leads to a slave ship and maybe jail, maybe jail is, is America. And so this book was perfect from beginning to end. It was heartbreaking, it was profound, it was, it was radical at times. Punching the Air de uh, really details the wrongful incarceration of a boy, um, Amal, and his journey whilst going through his trial and his imprisonment. Um, and so this novel is really the perfect YA novel if you're trying to challenge the system. So I'll read, I'll read the blurb of this. And it says, the story that I thought was my life didn't start on the day I was born. Amal Shahid was, has always been an artist and a poet, but even in his diverse art school, because of a biased system, he's seen as disruptive and unmotivated. Then one fateful night, an altercation in a gentrifying neighborhood escalates into tragedy. Boys just being boys turns out to be true only when those boys are white. The story that I think will be my life starts today. Suddenly, at 16 years old, Amal is convicted of a crime he didn't commit and sent to prison. Despair and rage almost sink him until he turns to the refuge of his words, his art. This never should have been his story, but can he change it? With spellbinding lyricism, award-winning author E.B. Zaboy and prison reform activist Yusuf Salam tell a moving and deeply profound story about how one boy is able to maintain his, his humanity and fight for the truth in a system designed to strip him of both. One thing that I love about this novel is that the, there are characters in this novel that advocate for prison abolition. And after reading Our, prison, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis, you know, that abolition piece is very important. Um, prisons are not something that can be reformed. These systems are not things that, that can be reformed. And I, I love and appreciate that even though Yusuf Salam calls himself a reform activist, you know, they did put a character in there that specifically, explicitly uses the word abolition to describe her activism. This is a topic that really I feel must be discussed with young people, you know? Amal really gives voice to black and brown youth that are deeply entrenched and affected by these systems, um, you know, black and brown youth that really have been failed by society, you know? What I really felt was like the most gut-wrenching aspect of this novel was Amal's relationship with his art teacher. Um, he has, he has, he takes this AP art class and in the book, they show how the teacher's actions, not only when they put her on the stand to testify uh, for Amal, but also her actions in the classroom, how they were a catalyst for Amal's current state. And I think that talking about things like the school to prison pipeline and the way that schools treat um, black and brown youth specifically, you know, even like public schools, you know, and I've talked many times about how a lot, a lot of times there's focus on these, um, there's a, a lot of focus placed on private schools and YA, but talking about public schools, talking about magnet schools, talking about these specialty schools, how they also fail black and brown students. Angela Davis really said it best in Our Prisons Obsolete. She said, when children attend schools that place a greater value on discipline and security than on knowledge and intellectual development, they are attending prep schools for prison. And so every single poem in this book 
that made up this novel. Every single piece of artwork that lined these pages built this incredible portrait of what it means to be young and Black and existing in the American carceral system. And so I would say that punching the air is a must read. People like kind of skimming the surface with these topics, but they don't dive in like this book does. So pick up Punching the Air by Evie Zavoy. The next book uh, is a book that I really enjoy. And, you know, I don't think that it, it wasn't as, you know, as, as uh, tough. It wasn't as, uh, as sort of dark as, as the what Punching the Air was about, but it was also a middle grade novel. And I'm not a person that reads a lot of middle grade, but to be honest, middle grade is really eaten up YA. Like I've picked up a lot of middle grade novels that really the writing has been better, the way they tackle topics has been better, um, the way they, they sort of are challenging what is the norm and what is popular um, has been just so much better. So I ended up reading uh, Lupe Wong Won't Dance by Donna Barbara Higuera. And uh, this was such an enjoyable middle grade. Lupe Wong Won't Dance basically is about this young girl, Lupe Wong, and she loves baseball. And after the death of her father, her uncle promised to take her to meet uh, this baseball player that her and her father really saw and looked up to. And the only way that she'll be able to meet this baseball player is if she gets straight A's. And so she's always been good at sports. She's gonna be, she's like, you know, this is gonna be easy getting an A in gym. I do well in all of my classes. Gym is definitely gonna be a piece of cake because I am amazing at baseball. I'm a natural at baseball. I train all the time. I'm super athletic. But then the school says that for their, uh, that semester, they are going to have to learn how to square dance. And there's basically like this square dancing competition that they must uh, be a part of. And that's going to determine your grade. And she's like, I don't wanna dance. I do not wanna dance. And so um, Lupe Wong goes on like this mission to get this square dancing eliminated from the curriculum basically and have things go back to normal. Um, because she really like desperately wants to meet, meet this baseball player. Lupe Wong has really been the type of person that has been championing for different causes throughout her entire life, which was so great to see. Like a child that really advocates for herself and advocates for others. This whole mission about the square dancing ends up leading Lupe to battle whether or not, ends up having like this sort of internal battle where Lupe Wong has to figure out whether or not she is doing this simply to get an A um, or truly advocating for others and having to reflect on who she is kind of stepping on in order to move forward um, and, and get this A. It builds a lot of discussion around grief about standing up for yourself, um, about advocating for a cause, about maintaining healthy friendships. Um, and, and I think the advocating for a cause part is really great because especially as younger people are beginning to, you know, move into activism and want to be activists and um, they really have to start talking and having conversations about who they are doing it for and who they are helping and why they want to help people. Um, and if they are doing things selflessly, if they're doing things that are for the betterment of their community as a whole, oh, not stepping on people, not harming people in the process, um, and not doing more harm than good, you know? And so I thought that this was an absolutely wonderful book. Um, I thought that this was a great middle grade read and, you know, I would totally give this to high schoolers too. I thought that it read really well. It didn't feel immature. Um, it didn't feel too simplified, but it wasn't like an overhaul of, of anything. It was just like, you know, you, it, 
the author wasn't telling you what to think. The author wasn't telling you like, this is the message of my book. However, you were able to grasp the message. So if anybody's read Lupe Wong Won't Dance, let me know your thoughts. Um, and I actually, uh, Ashley at Bookish Realm had talked about this book in a video like last, like the end of last year. And so I have been wanting to read it and I finally got a chance to read it and it was really great. Um, so last but not least, I want to talk about uh, a children's version of a adult nonfiction book. And we got to talk about Emmanuel Acho. I recall last year when a ton of people were picking up uncomfortable conversations with a black man. And this was during the surge, like right at the height of the pandemic, right at the height of all of the protests last year when people were like like knocking down the doors of every single bookstore to pick up as many Robin D'Angelo, Ibram X. Kendi, and you know, any other anti-racist book that they could pick up. And so I saw that this Emmanuel Acho book was just flying off of the shelves. Come to find out he has a YouTube channel um, where he where he has these uncomfortable conversations I really like I had heard, like I had heard some things but I wasn't really paying attention but I myself had on, my own books on on lists that I was planning on reading during that specific time I didn't just only say I'm going to read like these books marketed as anti-racist literature I was reading you know Baldwin I was reading you know Asada I was reading Angela Davis I was reading you know fiction and non-fiction just you know trying to I was reading I ended up reading Revolutionary Suicide last summer by Huey P. Newton you know just trying to you know engage with with what was going on um and educate myself uh even further um, but I was kind of wary of a lot of these books. But this year, in what I personally feel is a cash grab, a lot of people were doing these children's versions of these adult books. And I th I'm not going to discount and say that all of the children's versions of these anti-racist books are inherently bad. But I'm wondering about what purpose they serve. So we'll get into, into that discussion. And I definitely want everybody to engage with this. So let me know, you know, in the comment sections, your thoughts. So Emmanuel Acho released a children's edition of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And it was, it's titled Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Boy. And I read this book in a couple of hours. Um, I did a Twitter thread, which I'll include uh, in the I'll include in the description box. I'll include the link, and I'll also try to post like screenshots. I was taking pictures of like certain passages that stood out to me, um, and I was also ranting on Twitter about the book. So I'm sure you already can tell how I feel about it. But um, uncomfortable conversation with a black boy um is the middle grade adaption of uncomfortable conversations with a black man which is inspired by the viral series uncomfortable conversations with a black man um and this book it it made my head hurt <laughs> um i picked up this book after passing it um after passing really just like passing on all, all the hype of the original version um, but I was really intrigued by the fact that it had been made into a children's version. Like, you know, we have like anti-racist baby and, and, you know, like all of these, you know, the, as like the million and a half editions of stamps, like now they're stamped for kids. And so, you know, I'm interested in what these books are bringing to the table. I have, I have a lot of complicated feelings about the burst of new anti-racist children's literature that's really on the market and whether folks are actually vetting this content or just buying it so that they can say that they did it. But I ended up deciding, you know, to give this a chance. And so I had various points and I'm looking at my Goodreads review because it's been a hot minute since I've read this, but it's all like coming back. So I wanna make sure that my thoughts are accurate to how I was feeling at that time and um and different things so i made i made various bullet points on this so first of all 
Um, what really struck me about this book was Acho's introduction. So this whole thing is this these uncomfortable conversations with a Black man. Um, he's enlightening white audiences about Black people. Emmanuel Acho specifically even says in his introduction that for a good portion of his life, he did not identify with the Black community growing up. Acho is Nigerian American. He attended a predominantly Black church, but he says that he felt misunderstood and outcast within Black spaces um, up until he played football in college um, with a majority Black team. And then he started to, you know, understand Black culture. This really had me on the fence, okay? Um, why does Emmanuel Acho feel that he is the best person to have these conversations about issues concerning the Black community and, and serve as any sort of authority in forming white folks when he himself, up until college, was unconnected to the Black community? It feels like he himself is still finding his place. And I've, I've been seeing, you know, a lot... As of late, Emmanuel Acho, we can tell that, you know, the Nigerian community as well <laughs> as the uh, Black American community, the Nigerian American community as well as the Black American community, African American community does not feel very kindly towards that man. Um, he has said some very ignorant things. He has said a lot of ignorant things, you know, outside of that uncomfortable conversation with the black man. I think the man is a sports commentator. And he also is a, you know, he also hosted like The Bachelor. And so he's not a historian. He's not a sociologist. Doesn't do anything within academia, career-wise. So for him to do this, it kind of threw me off. Number two. It was all just the straight liberalism for me of this book, okay? Throughout this book, Emmanuel Acho offers these, these, uh, these moments called Let's Get Uncomfortable. And I, I, I understand that this book is for children. It's a children's edition, but I'm, it, it kind of, it's like, if this is what you're saying to children, what are you telling adults? So he offers these, these reflective moments called Let's Get Uncomfortable, followed by a call to action in a way. And while he calls for diversity and inclusion and peaceful protests, highlighting the peaceful, which always is a red flag for me, um, he offers very little calls for anything that would lead to real substantial systemic change. He, he mentions, you know, the idea of defunding the police, but he doesn't go as far as to, uh, to say anything, the, the calls for this radical idea of abolition. He then, he then proceeds to offer instructions for how black children need to handle themselves around the police. And I hate that. I really hate that. We have, we have seen an uptick in the, in, in the, visibility of people knowing that Black parents have to have these talks with their kids. But Emmanuel Acho, you are not their parents. You do not need to tell kids. And I, I fear for what this leads to with children. When you are constantly policing them and telling them, this is how you need to act. This is how you need to act. This is, you need to, you, you know, like the, the, the don't make any smart comments, you know, like, you know, be respectful, all of that stuff. While it is life-saving measures, why are, in a book that, in a book that's not for Black kids, and I'll get to this later, in a book that was not written for Black kids, what are you saying to white kids when you are constantly holding Black children to this standard and making them super account, like holding them to the standard and making them accountable for their actions with police officers rather than holding the officers accountable for their reactions and interactions with black youth. It's frustrating. 
that these are the conversations that you feel are so important for your book, your uncomfortable conversations with a black boy, with a black man. You know, what does that really say? After 150 pages, so this is point three, point three, um, Emmanuel Acho brings up Eva Max Kendi's claim that black people can be racist. And y'all, um, I, I didn't review Stamped. I didn't review Stamped, the, the big Stamped, which I read, Stamped from the beginning. Um, because while I think that Stamped from the beginning is a great piece, a great historical book, Eva Max Kendi as a person, I have personal issues with. And I'll link a, um, an article which was written, um, which specifically talks about Ibram X. Kennedy's politics, his, his politics when he specifically is talking about, um, when he specifically is talking about the ability of Black people to be racist. Hey, interestingly enough, I was very thankful that Emmanuel Acho was able to recognize the flaws in Ibram X. Kennedy's claim. Okay, power is required for racism. Okay, and black folks simply do not hold the power to be this racial oppressor. And when black folks in, in higher positions, when they enforce racist policies that harm black folks, this is internalized anti-blackness. This is not, um, they are not racist. Okay, um, but uh, Acho ends up backpedaling towards the end of this book and he says, a black person can be racist individually, but black people as a whole don't have enough power in America to affect systemic racism. This statement right there is a ball of contradictions and it it's so confusing to young audiences and those who are attempting to learn. Like, why are you going to then contradict yourself towards the end of this book, a book that is written for young people? Four, and this is this is my, my last point. I really want to know what is the goal for creating these guidebooks for white audiences? If somebody could answer that for me, what is the goal of creating these guidebooks for white audiences? What is the evidence that any of this, any of these books, Robin DiAngelo, I'll go hard on Robin DiAngelo because we ended up finding out that she's not even following her own advice these books, these, these, you know, children's books, you know, outside of like books that are doing really important work, like A for activists, like when you're educating kids about history, when you're telling them about all of these things, what are these books actually doing? Is there any actual evidence that this is doing any real tangible work to, to challenge the systems that are actively oppressing black people. These books feel like they're a pat on the wrist for racists. Acho speaks to his young white brothers and sisters, comforts them about how racism is not their fault individually, tells them to have conversations and, and advocate for more black teachers at their schools, etc. cetera. And while, while he uses words like systemic racism, while, while he uses words like white supremacy, which may feel radical, you know? People are very comfortable using the word white supremacy now. And while it feels radical, his challenges don't feel direct or strong. In addition to this, Acho cites YouTube videos and a few online articles and YA text to further learning. And I'm wondering what he himself has read beyond this. Because I think it often shows whether or not these authors are actually reading this, anything beyond just their Twitter timelines. He feels like he himself is at the beginning stages of in interrogating his politics himself. It feels as if he read Ibram X. Kendi's stamp from the beginning as an introduction to anti-racism and then, you know, was like, I'm gonna write this book. He himself has not done any extensive reading. And, and while I feel like he has the right to write what he wants, I challenge whether he is equipped to have fully flushed out conversations on race. And once again, you know, what is his goal? I believe that reading this really has confirmed my irritation with us continuing to say 
let's have a conversation about that. Let's continue this conversation. This is a necessary conversation. Where do the conversations end and the action really begin? When do we move beyond the same liberal talking points and begin to challenge entire systems? Children are ready for these talks. In Punching the Air by Ibi Zaboy and Yusuf Salam, they challenge the carceral system. They include characters that explicitly discuss prison abolition. And that's what I need to see more of. This is not to say that Emmanuel Acho is wrong about everything. But to me, this text does a disservice to those who read this and are searching for a guide on the next steps for fighting racism. So I feel like there are a lot of books, you know, that I would encourage people to read beyond this. In terms of fiction, I would suggest reading Punch in the Air by E.B. Zaboy and Yusuf Salam. I would encourage reading Anger is a Gift by Mark Ashiro. In terms of nonfiction books, I would definitely encourage reading Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. I would encourage reading We Want to Do More Than Survive, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom by Bettina L. Love. I would encourage reading Race Matters by Cornel West. I would encourage reading From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation by Kianga Yamada Taylor. There are books out there that I think that young people are really at the stage where they can read. And so I think that, you know, we really have to talk about these books. You know, we really have to interrogate these books. We can't just say, you know, oh, this book talks about social justice. This is what the kids need to read. We need to be like, is this book good? Have you read it yourself before you give it to children? Do you have a deep understanding of systemic racism, of white supremacy, of structural racism, of uh, the school to prison pipeline, of homophobia and transphobia, of, you know, just all of the things within society that are deeply affecting black and brown people historically and in the present day. So, let me know what you think in the comment section below. I'm excited to see where YA literature is going um, in terms of, you know, challenging systemic racism and people writing really, people not, not half-assing uh, YA lit and books that are discussing racism, like really, really doing work. So, you know, I'm going to step off my soapbox and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you comment something <laughs> and I will see all of you in the next one. And always remember that you are loved.